Released by Fully Ramblematic in 2004 on the PC, Seven Days a Skeptic would be the second game of the Chizou Mythos series. Written and directed by creator Ben Croshaw, also known as Yahtzee of the Zero Punctuation Review series, the game would be a sequel to the establishing game Five Days a Stranger. For story, the game features a starship psychologist named John Somerset alongside five other crew members on a scouting mission in space. For gameplay, conventions typical of a point-and-click adventure would be used, as players may move, look around, talk, and use key items on interactive points. The story only gets larger from here, so let's cut it down to size with a recapitation. As the game begins, it's July 14, 2385, as we see on a computer console of a man named Malcolm, the news that the scout ship Mephistopheles was refitted with upgrades and relaunched to explore the Caracas galaxy. Later, on July 27th, we see ship psychologist John is called to a crew meeting, where Captain Barry announces their scanners have picked up some sort of strange metallic rectangular object floating in space. Unsure of its exact nature, they have been advised by High Command to leave a beacon for a science team to investigate. However, the captain is keen to get a closer look and orders the object to be retrieved, eager at the opportunity of a first contact situation before he retires. The crew is divided on this opinion as Helmsman Serena thinks they should follow regulations, but the first officer Angela is fine with investigating as it's most likely debris and would save wasted effort. The ship's doctor, William Taylor, doesn't care either way, and the engineer Adam is fine to go with whatever the captain says. As Adam brings the metal box in, Angela logs a composition of the container while John notices the plaque on the side being an epitaph for John Defoe from the year 1997 alongside a little drawing of a trilby hat. Seeing that it is likely a coffin with human remains within, Angela suggests taking it to the nearest space station for appropriate researchers. As everyone loses interest quickly, John is still curious how human remains from centuries ago ended up floating out here in this unknown galaxy. The next day, John wakes up from a sudden nightmare of the casket they found opening up and something crawling out. He notes the engines aren't on strangely and Adam confirms they are experiencing a temporary power outage but the emergency systems should kick in soon. Checking out the non-functional elevator himself, John finds a bloody machete stabbed into the components on top of the lift, and curiouser still, finds the casket they found indeed open and empty. Soon after, Angela and Serena inform him the captain has gone missing, and with the power out, they cannot scan the ship for vitals. Adam is strangely distant and uncooperative, though he helps John investigate their technical problems. Going for a spacewalk to check out their communication masks, he finds the problem with their equipment, likely due to the body of Captain Barry, impaled upon it. The next day, the crew meets to discuss what they know so far. John starts by proposing the captain was attacked by something with the machete, tried to go outside, and the attacker finished him off. As the crew starts to become suspicious of a traitor among them, John tries to calm them down by pointing out the box they took in is also open, and he has a bad feeling something was in there. As commanding officer, Angela agrees they should remain calm and operate under the assumption that everyone here is innocent, but William refuses to ignore the notion of a murderer among them storming off. Adam throws some suspicion on William as he leaves, but Serena wants to stay focused on the task of contacting High Command. First things first, Barry's body needs to be removed from the pylons, and again Adam refuses to help as John volunteers to go. As he revisits the mast, he is surprised to see the body is no longer there, and since the ship is at a standstill, it's not likely it was dislodged on its own. Regardless, with the equipment clear, he radios Serena to send a distress signal now, but Serena's communication is cut off by what sounds like an attack. Hurrying back to the bridge, he sees Angela there instead, also asking where Serena is and noting she and the captain were the only people who knew the communication code to send a distress signal. She doubts anything wrong happened to Serena and instead wishes to track down the captain's codebook. Unsure, John still investigates the captain's quarters, finding the codebook, and with it they manage to send out a beacon and successfully contact a nearby ship. The rescue won't be here for another five days, and at this time, Adam comes in claiming he just saw the captain alive in engineering, albeit moving strangely and wearing bloody clothes. Neither one believes him as John takes him back to his quarters for rest, though just as he does, a bloody blacksmith barges in, hacking down both Adam and John just as John wakes up again. The next day, Serena is still missing, and William points out the only person who claims to have found the captain and heard Serena struggle on the radio is John, yet no one else can verify this to clear him. To this, Adam counters as he was on comms and checked the logs, verifying John was indeed outside while something happened to Serena, and as William leaves again, notes how awfully suspicious he is. Angela suggests they split up and look for Serena as her status is still unverified, and as John is the last to leave, he catches a glimpse of Serena for just a moment before she disappears. Thinking to grab a quick meal, he visits the cafeteria only to be shocked that the food dispenser gives him a tray covered in blood. Examining the machine, a freshly severed hand falls out, and suspecting it belongs to Serena, he heads to medbay to examine it. 
Finding William there, he explains the situation, and as William offers to run tests on the hand, he hands John a UV light to see if he can find a blood trail anywhere from there. Finding a trail leading from a vent to a panel, he finds Serena's bloody torso, but then Serena herself quickly enters and then leaves again, and in the confusion, Angela walks in on John standing over the corpse. The next day, Angela locks John up in the brig at gunpoint, finding him the most suspect, and while he pleads his case of innocence, the bloody body of the captain enters the room, quickly walking behind Angela and snapping her neck. Bloody Barry unlocks a cell too, coming after John next, though John swiftly grabs Angela's dropped stun gun and shoots him, halting him for now. A game of cat and mouse ensues as Barry's body roams the ship looking for John, but in the reactor room, the counselor manages to knock the imposter off the railing. As he finds William and Adam in hiding from the monster, they all meet on the bridge to discuss the current situation. John again thinks that's not really Barry and something that looks like him, and Adam points out that the vital sensors only pick up three life forms on the ship, so whatever it is, it cannot be sensed. Since there is no way to know if they are out of danger, Adam suggests they use William's keycard that has access to the escape pods, and reluctantly they all agree to take their chances outside the ship. The next day, they prepare the escape pod, but William is late to arrive, and checking on his quarters, John sees blood seeping out from under it. Taking the hint, he hurries back to Adam with the update, but they need William's keycard to launch the escape pod. Hacking the door, John enters and is horrified to see the dead crewmates so far butchered apart and sorted across the room. William himself doesn't seem to be in the room, but the keycard is, and grabbing it, he quickly returns to Adam, still in disbelief at what he saw. John still insists something evil must have come out of the locker, and Adam corrects him, about to mention what was actually in the locker, but quickly pauses. Catching this, John realizes it was Adam who opened the locker, calling him out on it and demanding to know what was inside. Cautiously, Adam confesses he had a nightmare, something in the box killed them all, and checking inside the box himself, all he found was a welding mask, leather apron, machete, and a small wooden idol. There was also a letter inside that he shows John, explaining that to whomever finds this box, close it, seal it again, and send it out into space. The notice from a man named Trilby, who went from being a cat burglar to a special agent, and he recalls the events of the Defoe Manor incident. The wraith they found and destroyed was named John Defoe, though a few years later in 1997, Trilby would investigate the murder of a survivor of the manor incident, again finding the cursed African wooden idol that hosted a vengeful spirit that would possess any that touched it. Wary of means to destroy it in his time, he instead arranged to have it launched into space in a probe meant to explore the outer region of the solar system. Again, Trilby urges any who find this box to save themselves by shooting it back into space. Choosing to leave now, they open the airlock only to find the hatch was sabotaged, as the pod was already jettisoned and Adam is sucked into space instead. Quickly sealing the airlock door, John survives but blacks out. The next day, John wakes up strapped to a chair, as William is there, as well as a mostly stitched together body. William states the body is almost complete and John's parts will help with that, as this will be the new body for the man from the box to occupy. Choosing not to go along with that plan, John frees himself of the chair, stabbing William in the leg and escapes for now. The next day, John hides in the vents, knowing the other ship should be arriving sometime that same day. Hearing William cry out, he peers out to see the doctor dying, and explaining the body needed eyes, so it claimed his and ran him through. Freed of his influence, William apologizes to John, and suggests using the stun gun to stop and trap the monster before the Federation gets here. With the constructed cadaver hounding him at every turn, John puts on a spacesuit and gets them both sucked outside, though by some magic the other John is undeterred. Luring him back to the radio mass where Barry was found, he traps the monster the same way, stopping it dead in its tracks, but knowing this body was just a vessel for the wraith. As the game ends, John takes the idol as it doesn't affect him through the suit, and tosses the cursed doll into the ship's exhaust, incinerating it completely. Not long after, the rescue ship arrives, but within, John is surprised to be already met by men who claim they are off-world security, specifically seeking John. Confirming his claim he is Dr. Jonathan Somerset, ship counselor, the security team explains the real Dr. Somerset is a 65-year-old man who was killed six months ago by an unknown assailant. Coming clean, the imposter John says he didn't mean to kill the doctor, and simply wanted to go into space as they arrest him and take him away. As the security team finds the rest of the dead bodies, they feel it's safe to pin all six murders on the imposter, who was really named Malcolm, noting the strange box, but leaving it behind right before it seems something has survived. Seven Days of Skeptic is free, so go download it, enjoy, and donate to the creator, worldwide.